Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody who's stubborn about changing their mind? It's a difficult task because stubborn people, and we're all stubborn at times, are prideful. And turning away from something or admitting you're wrong is a difficult thing when you have pride. So can you imagine the reaction? Well, you don't really need to imagine the reaction. It's written there for you in our Old Testament reading in Jeremiah 26, when God sends his prophet to a stubborn people. And he doesn't send him with a nice message. He sends them with a good message, but not one that they really want to hear. It's a rebuke, a reproof from God himself that they have been living in ways that are displeasing to him. And so he sends Jeremiah. I don't know if I could have as much courage as Jeremiah does in that situation. For he simply tells them, because they basically are trying to get the leaders of the city to kill him, that he says, well, the Lord has delivered me into your hands, do with me what you will, but just know that these really are the words from God, and if you kill me, innocent blood will be on your hands, and it won't end well for you. Now, I certainly hope myself as someone sent to preach and teach God's word, but I never find myself in that similar situation. I don't believe it would happen here at Ascension. But it is true, though, still today, that often God can call us to share his word, and it's not always what we would like to say. It's not always the comfortable thing to say. But our gospel reading today from Luke chapter 13 helps us understand that even when the word that God sends us with is difficult to hear, it's still good. And its end is still God's desire to gather his people to himself. As Lutherans, we love dividing up the scriptures in law and gospel. When I teach confirmation class, the definition of law is what we are to do for God. And the definition of the gospel is what God has done for us. And by dividing that up, we can see the purpose of God's word in these different situations. Obviously, in the case of Jeremiah, he was not bringing a word primarily of gospel, but one of law. Because what God desired of his people was to repent, to turn away from the wickedness that they were doing and that they were involved in. And when God brings his law to bear in the lives of sinners in the Old Testament and today, you don't have to t have me tell you that sometimes it's unpleasant. And it's unpleasant not because itself, as Paul tells us, the law is certainly not bad in and of itself, but it makes us feel bad because it reveals who we really are. Sinners. Delinquent children unfaithful people of God. But it should be a comfort to you to know that this happened even back in Jeremiah's day and even long before that. Because this isn't anything new. That God sends his people, sends to his people rather, his word. But then we get to some specifics in Jesus' talk in the gospel of the city of Jerusalem. Because somebody, some of the Pharisees come to Jesus, and they seem to be trying to help him out. They say, Herod is seeking you, and he wants to kill you. And Jesus has kind of a spunky response to that. He says, go and tell that fox... Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I will finish my course. 
Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Notice that Jesus gives you three days twice there. And of course, we know now what he is foreshadowing, what he is referring to that's going to occur in Jerusalem is his death and resurrection. That's what he's come to do, and no threat from an earthly ruler is going to prevent him from carrying out the task which God has sent him to his people for. Just like Jeremiah. Jeremiah probably thought many times about, "Ah, maybe I'm not going to say this, because I'm going to tell a bunch of people with a lot more earthly power than I have something they don't want to hear. And it's easy to turn away from that. I mean, it's even easy to turn away from it when there's just relational risk, much less the threat of actual jail time or corporal punishment in the case of Jeremiah. How often have we turned away from the truth of God's word in our conversations with our loved ones and friends and coworkers out of fear for how they'll respond, out of fear for how our relationship might change. And yet God still sends us with these words. And you've probably heard me refer a couple of times to the response in the service that we have to God's word, the reading of God's word. It doesn't change, does it? It stays the same even if you get to the end of the gospel reading and you're thinking to yourself, that didn't really feel very gospel-y. And I still have to say, this is the gospel the Lord prays to you, O Christ. Yeah, we do. Because God's word is always good. But hopping back to Jerusalem, why is Jesus so fixed on Jerusalem? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One ties it to the Old Testament. Jerusalem is the city where God chose to make his dwelling among his people. That's where he chose to be with his people on earth. But now, in Jesus, it's becoming even more important because it's his chosen place for the salvation of the world. His chosen place for the final, ultimate act that fulfills all the promises that God had made throughout the Old Testament to his people is going to occur in Jerusalem. And notice now, even now, Jesus knows exactly what it's going to cost. Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. He knows what the response from the people of God is going to be to the word that he bears them. And yet he goes. And the gospel reading also highlights why he goes. He doesn't go because God is an angry judge who enjoys inflicting harsh words of rebuke upon wayward children. He doesn't go to prove that he is right and we are wrong. He goes because he wishes to gather his people back to himself. All of his words, all of his teachings, all of his actions are with that goal in mind. Because despite what sometimes the word of God, how the word of God makes us feel, They're all given in love. It's all grounded in this love of God which desires to gather us back to him, away from the things that he knows will harm us and destroy us to the salvation of his son, Jesus. So how is God gathering you? We don't have prophets anymore that are called to come to our cities and rebuke our cities, because they would certainly have plenty to say today, like they have throughout history. Because the truth is, we're not really that much different than the people that Jeremiah was sent to in our Old Testament reading. We're a wayward people of God who are stubborn, who don't want to receive the word that is sent to us at times, and often have harsh responses to those whom he sends. How is God gathering you? How has his word come to you lately? 
Has it been through a person? Has it been through your own reading of the scripture? Maybe it happened in a church service. Have you ever felt sometimes, I used to feel this when I was on the receiving end of sermons, that I was like, that guy follow me around? How does he know what I'm thinking about or what I went through this week? Now, he doesn't, but God does. And with his word comes his Holy Spirit to speak into your lives. Sometimes it's not a pleasant experience because he's reminding us of something we did that we shouldn't have done or something we should have done and didn't do. But it also always brings the gospel. The reminder that despite what the law has accused you of, you no longer live under that law. But that your sin is forgiven in Christ. That even that law, that word of law, is meant to gather you back to him. Because he loves you and wishes you safe. And wishes to be with you for eternity. So the short answer to the question of how God is gathering you today is Jesus, right? Our great Sunday school answer. It really is. That's the difference between Jeremiah's day and ours, is Jesus has come and he has accomplished the work that he's referring to in our gospel reading. He did go to Jerusalem despite knowing what awaited him there because he loved you. He did speak all of the words to his disciples. He did bring the word of law and rebuke to the people of Jerusalem and the people of God and the word of the gospel and the love of Jesus because he loves you and desires to gather you back to himself. That is what is different now from the day of Jeremiah. But what is the same is that still, at times, in our stubbornness, We don't want to hear what God has to say. And this is where one of the things that I've always enjoyed about the Christian faith is the familiarity of God's word. I love the the verse that says that, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because in our current culture, that brings up stick in the mud, traditionalism kind of imagery. But what it really means is that no matter what happens, the word that God sends to you does not change. That no matter what you do or say or don't do or say, God's desire to gather you to himself does not change. The purpose of the words that he sends to you do not change. They are for life. They are for forgiveness. And they are for salvation. For your God desires you. He wishes to gather you back to himself. That was true when he sent Jeremiah. It was true when he sent Moses and all the prophets in the Old Testament. And it was most certainly true when he sent Jesus. It's still true today. When he sends you his written word to read. When he sends you people in your life who bring the word of God to bear, the gospel, a healing balm in a time of suffering and trial, the law as a rebuke to turn you away from danger and wickedness, all with the goal, undergirded by the love of Jesus, to gather you back to himself. Some of you in Bible class have heard me describe the Christian life as a cycle. It isn't a set of self-help steps that 10 years from now you're going to have less to confess when you come here before God, that 10 years from now you're going to be reading your Bible more minutes a day than you are today. That's not what it's about. It's a cycle that begins and ends in Jerusalem with the cross, Jesus. That is where we are today. And tomorrow you'll go out from this place and you'll be tempted And you'll ignore God's word, and you'll fall into that temptation, and you'll sin. But in God's great mercy, he has designed his word to be available to you. He sends it to you and people in your daily reading of the scriptures. And where does that word drive you? It drives you back to Jerusalem, back to the cross, back to Jesus. And then the cycle starts again. Permanently keeping you at the cross and the empty tomb. For the greatest act of mercy and love done for you. And Jesus has indeed gathered you to himself as forgiven children of God. 
who will be with him forever. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in God's word until Christ comes again to make everything new. Amen.